Thank you very much, uh, TCJ. Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Nzuweni. Good afternoon, Commissioner. No, I only have one question for you. Um, what is the difference between in consultation and after consultation in the legislative drafting? In consultation and after consultation. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to venture. I'm going to venture an answer here, and in doing so, I'm led by 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 the wording. Looking at the wording, um, I would say in consultation by the legislature. Obviously, we have a system which. Um, encourages public to participate, for instance, in the passing of legislation. So in consultation, I assume uh, it is to say you consulted in, within. And then after consultation, uh, uh, it's to consult afterwards. I said it's a venture. Let's follow up on this point, uh, Madam, uh, Madam DCJ. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask you a broad question. Um, I mean, the short answer to the in versus after mm -hmm. is that in consultation means that the person who is trusted with the power to make the decision may not make the decision without consulting mm -hmm. with the identified party. And mm -hmm. after consultation means that they may make it provided that mm -hmm. they consult. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, the, the real issue is that this question coincides with my larger concern about your application. Mm. I've read the seven judgments you, you highlighted. Uh, it's admittedly only three that I've read with some detail because I wanted to just get a sense of your, of your skill set. Mm -hmm. They are competently written. Um, I mean, there's one that you've done on uh, universal partnership, which is a competently written judgment. Thank you. But what's manifest is that you lack skills on pure constitutional law and public law in general. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder how that can be sorted out, because this was the same problem you confronted in the last interview, where you couldn't describe the, 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 the distinction uh, between uh, constitutional supremacy and uh, constitutional democracy. I think you tripped yourself up on those concepts, just like the, the in versus after consultation concept that you, you've tripped yourself up. So I wonder whether there is anything you're planning to do if you are recommended to show up your, your because clearly you've got the ability, I mean, judging from what you've produced, but it may be that the answer maybe is that you add some more, or maybe the answer is that you just read yourself up into the area. But there's clearly a need for you to balance the, the public law knowledge. Thank you, Commissioner. I take the point. Um, to, to work on the bench, you, you, you always learn. It's always a learning day, uh, learning curve, rather. Um, lack in public administration, I take the point. I won't argue with it, Commissioner. But yeah, I take your comments to heart. Thank you. No, I think the question is, what, what are you planning to do about it? I mean, I think it's manifest that there is a problem there, but it may be that that's something you have a clear idea what to do with it so that we are confident when we recommend you that it's something you know is a problem and you've got a plan to deal with it. As I said, I've got infinite capacity for research. If a matter is placed before me, I'll make it my point that I do a thorough research. Can I follow up? No, I, I share this concern and um, I, I was a bit disconcerted by one of your answers earlier. Mm. Um, when, I, uh, you know, one of the law bodies had said, you know, maybe you need a bit more acting experience, etc. Mm -hmm. And you said, well, what more am I supposed to do? And I think it links to the previous question. Mm. Isn't there more you can do other than wait for public and constitutional law judgments, matters to arrive on your table before researching them. Uh, given that being a judge of the Cape High Court involves administrative and constitutional matters mm -hmm. on a weekly basis, I would imagine. 
Thank you, Commissioner. I, I don't mean to say that uh, I will sit around and not do something to empower myself. Uh, I always have the appetite to, to, to empower myself. Uh, I'm sorry if I created an impression that uh, I would simply sit around and wait for the work. That, that's not how I do things. As, uh, as I've indicated previously with the other commissioner, immediately when I tripped on that question uh, on the previous occasion with the interviews, I went to look into that. So I do empower myself. I'm here today because I've empowered myself. Uh, I don't have a, a, a reputation of being lazy. I'm not saying the commissioner is saying that I'm a lazy person, uh, but I, I'm not a lazy person. But what specifically would you do? Read more, read more. Obviously, it appears I, I did not read more, but I'll read more. I'll make it a point that I'm going to read more where I lack in. But then perhaps maybe it's better that you, you read first and carry on acting before it's a permanent appointment. Okay, I, I take the point, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's just a follow-up on these two questions. We are aware that there is a continuous judicial training. Will you be attending those? Certainly. And uh, secondly, like, as judges often get involved in the, some of these training programs that are organized by law bodies, would you be assisting, are prepared to assist on that? 100% commission. And they are aware of this, Mr. Jay, and you would be availing yourself as one of the judges. Thank you very much. In fact, lastly, you, uh, do you agree with me that judges that or past candidates that are appointed, they do not, they have not in their practice done every aspect of the law? I, I agree 100%, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, what is the difference between in consultation and after consultation? Sorry, I didn't hear you. What is the difference between in consultation and after consultation? In consultation and after consultation. Yes. I'm not sure. I, I, if it's with reference to, to legal practitioners, um, then I think, no, I, I think if I'm going to respond, I'll probably be wrong. Uh, can I also follow up, Mr. Jay, on this point? Yes, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, I think the, the point that is really being asked is, is where a statute says, um, as an example, the president may take a decision to dissolve the JSC after consultation with the Minister of Justice. Mm -hmm. Or it says the president may dissolve the JSC in consultation with the Minister of Justice, whether you appreciate any distinction there. I think it's... it's All right. In, in, no, in, in, if I, do you mind if I... Yeah, please, I please, uh, yes. If it's the president may take a decision after consultation, I'll, I'll start there, then it means that um, before a decision is taken by the president, that consultation must have happened. Yes, correct. Um, and then the same statute says the president may take a decision to dissolve the JSC in consultation with the Minister of Justice. How does that differ to the first uh, answer? I think, and I speak under correction, that would mean that the actual decision has to almost happen jointly. So in other words, the Minister of, Just of Justice must consent. He has a veto. I'm not, I, I don't, no, if it's a consent, I don't know if I'd go as far as consent, 
but I would have to say an agreement. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I would rather consent. say an agreement because a consent, in my understanding, would mean, let's say, X is saying something and Y is here. X is... X has already made his mind up about whatever it is. Yes. Why the inconsent? So that for me would be, the inconsultation would be together or simultaneously, if I could put it that way. Yes, yes, yes. yes. In, in, almost like in concurrence. Yes. Yes, or with the concurrence. Yes. All right, well, that's the, the correct answer, but it, it's taken us a while to get there, which takes me to another question uh, about your grasp of constitutional law principles. You know, the, this judgment that uh, you've referred to here in your response, um, which you said you think the PLA is talking about the, the Ulu judgment. You remember that? Yes. Yes. Uh, now, I'm not particularly interested in the complaint that you, you, you referred a practitioner to uh, uh, the, the disciplinary proceedings. I think a judge is entitled to make that call. Um, so the criticism against you there, I personally think, is a bit unfair. What I do want to ask you, though, about is the jurisprudential logic of the judgment. My understanding of the basic facts there is that you had a BXI, which is the law firm, a corporate entity, and you had Barnabas Kulu, the person. Uh, BXI was the first respondent, and Kulu himself was the fifth respondent. Yes. That, that's correct. Yes. Now, in respect of BXI, you convicted them of contempt, correct? Yes. Yes. Now, in your judgment, you say that even though the order that was imposed by uh, Judge Rogers was an order for the payment of money, a contempt was still appropriate. If, if I, without going to the, the specific paragraphs, there were six orders. Yes. Um, I made a distinction also about... And I, now, let's just focus on the one order for, okay. for now. That's the order that said they shouldn't allow the trust account to fall below a certain amount. Yes. They should keep 3.4 million rands in their account. Your judgment says that's an order sounding in money. But you say that even in respect of an order sounding in money, a contempt is still competent. The, uh, do you mind if I get to the page? Yes, I can take you to the Thank page you. if you want. Um, it is at paragraph 43, page 107. Paragraph 43. All right, so that is where I, I, I dealt with the law insofar as the orders ad factum, sorry, ad pecuniam solvenda. Yes, that's an order for payment of Ye money. Yes. yes. Now, that's and the conclusion. Sorry, you want to say something No, else? no, go yeah. ahead, sorry. Now, that's the conclusion I want to ask you about. Yes. Now, were you at that stage aware of the Kutsia judgment of 1995 of the Constitutional Court, which made it clear that under the common law there is a distinction between an order for the performance of an act and an order for the payment of money. In an order for the payment of money, contempt is inappropriate. I did not refer to the, and I don't see, I did refer to, is it could see a government versus government of the Republic of South Africa? Uh, yes. Well, it's, let's forget about Kutsia, that's long ago. Let's take Machabeng, which is a 2017 judgment. Yes. Uh, the local municipality where at paragraph 56, it's made clear that the common law draws a sharp distinction between an order ad solvendum pecunium, which related to the payment of money, and an order ad factum praestandum, which calls upon a person to perform a duty or refrain from an action. And then it says, a failure to comply with the order to pay money is not regarded as contempt in our law, whereas the disobedience of the latter order is. My problem is that you seem to have mixed these principles up. At 
paragraph at paragraph 43 commissioner and yes, I, i'm not sure that's this why is, I, uh, i'm not sure if this is responding to your, your question yes that's the paragraph i'm saying it yes. seems to me that it mixes the principles and doesn't refer to the correct authorities all right, and, and where I say I do not understand the common law rule to exclude a declaration of contempt, in brackets I say the civil remedy, where there is willful and mala fide non-compliance with an order for the payment of money. Yes, exactly, and there's no footnote there, there's no authority at all, and the authority is, is in fact the opposite. I refer to the Cape Times Limited versus Union Trades. Yes, that's the, at, at footnote 64. And the actual correct authority is Machabeng, uh, which is the Constitutional Court Judgment of 2017. And Kutsia, Constitutional Court Judgment of 1995. I, very well. I can only respond as follows. I take your point, firstly, and I refer to Kutsia and Machabeng at footnote 61. Yes. I, I am aware um, when I, I think when I completed the application, I'm aware that the, I think leave to appeal was granted to the first respondent, the, the, comp, the incorporation. I'm not sure what happened thereafter. Yes, no, I'm only concerned about the contempt as sure. against the company. I'm not interested in the contempt against the person. Uh, that's where these principles are being discussed. I, I take your point, Commissioner. I can yes. also say that, um, because I don't know what the petition was all about, I'm aware that there was a petition to the SCA, and the SCA granted leave to the, to the company, to the incorporation. Well, yes, sounds further, sensible. Yes, further than that, I, I can't, but I, I, I hear what you say. Thank C you. Can I ask you a second question about yes. your grasp of the law of contempt? You say the problem is that it's, it's, it's foundational to the constitutional system as the Constitutional Court pointed out in, in the Zondo versus Zuma case yes. um, that you need to grasp the principles of the constitutional law. The other problem I have is paragraph 44, where you find on the proper preponderance of probabilities that the company is guilty of contempt, whereas it seems that the law is that you must find beyond a reasonable doubt. All right, then I'm going to, if I can go back in the judgment, we are deal with the legal principles, and I want to find that paragraph. Um, I'm at 44, yes. it's page um, 107. Yes, I'm, I'm going to the law which I set out from pages, sorry, from paragraphs 18 on, and I just want to find the place um, so that I can respond to, oh, here we go. So, I'm not sure if this is going to be of assistance. If I go to paragraph 21 of my judgment, and that's part yes. of, that, that's the section that deals with the legal principles. I then deal with, um, if we go, I deal with considerations of the, the judgments, Farkey, Feco, Birchall, and then I, I indicate there that the Constitutional Court in much are being clarified the position as follows. The standard of proof must be applied in accordance with the consequences of the remedies sought. If the relief applied for is a declaratory order, mandamus, structural interdict, or similar civil remedy, where the contemnor's right to freedom and security is not deprived, then the civil standard of proof on a balance of probabilities applies. And I refer there to, uh, at footnote 30, Birchall versus Birchall. Uh, it's a 2005, I think it's Eastern Cape Division. Uh, and the, in the footnote I said, relief sought was committal to prison for failure to comply with a maintenance order. At paragraph 21, I go further and I say, with the civil contempt remedies of committal to prison or the imposition of a fine or sought, which impact on the contemptor's freedom and security of person, then the criminal standard beyond reasonable doubt applies. Yes, no, I so, understand that. That's, that's why I also went to look at your order to see if it was a mere declarator. And I found that your order actually imposes a fine on the company, which is a criminal sanction. Then, and I'm going to stand corrected by you, Commissioner. Um, I, I have no 
I have no qualm being corrected because you've referred me to the to the cases, and then it must be that. Well, let me not rather not jump to conclusions. My understanding is that the SCA then granted leave to the company. No, I understand. I, I don't want to get into the leave sure. issue. I just want to get your grasp of the principles of constitutional law. Because the distinction you see, which is where declarator is sought, applying the standard of balance of probabilities may be appropriate, which is correct. But the problem with your judgment is that you, it, you actually imposed a criminal fine applying a civil standard. That's again the confusion I'm pointing to. I can't argue then with you, Commissioner, on that. Um, then. Yeah, I, I, I can't I can't comment further. I, I will I will accept what you say. Thank you.